Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, thanks to the chair and to Dr. Ekan Tubuslu um, for the invitation. Um, today's talk will be uh, based on uh, partly on my research on Islam in Europe, on European Islam, and the Imams in Western Europe. Uh, so, um, so I will not be uh, presenting the paper, but uh, general uh, views on the topic, and we'll be open the floor for discussion uh, as I enjoy it. Um, well, starting with a historical note, uh, Marshall Hudson, somewhere in one of his three uh, uh, big volumes, and the venture of Islam, the great historian, American historian, says that uh, we need, quoting someone else, uh, say, saying that we need to be cautious when we speak about history. If we, we should need, we need to know at least some 3,000 years of human history one before we, we speak. So some epistemological majesty is important. I'm saying this because um, I'll, I'll uh, start with uh, two perspectives, historical perspectives about Islam and Europe and Islam and the West before I move to talk, uh, to talk about the current issues. The famous uh, uh, scholar of Islam and Middle Eastern history, Ottoman history, uh, Bernard Lewis, uh, has certain views in the study of uh, Europe, Islam and Europe. Uh, he says, you know, um, that uh, the post-colonial period has left uh, a mark on Muslim societies, and this mark uh, has traveled with its with the laborers, with the immigrants, when they uh, uh, went to Europe post World War II Europe for work. He calls this general resentment against the West. Um, in later work in 2010. He, speak, he says that the emergence of a Europe population, many millions strong, of Muslims born and educated in Western Europe will have immense and unpredictable consequences for Europe, for Islam, and for the relations between them. He leaves it that vague uh, uh, because these consequences could be of different interpretations, right? Um, and after the Arab Spring, uh, he, his, he, his view didn't change, but there is different uh, touch in it, uh, where he refers to the possibilities between overcoming the classical dichotomies between the East and West, in the sense the East, meaning the Islamic East, uh, Western civilization, Western civilization, etc. Um, and I'm saying this. Because uh, Bernard Lewis was seen by many as a representative of a particular view, because they scholars uh, and some commentators take his political views and the war in Iraq and put them uh, uh, in communion with his views, scholarly views, That's great scholarly views, uh, anyway, that um, uh, are respected in scholarship. Um, and the other trend of scholarship, and not very uh, other trend, is uh, can be uh, exemplified by a note by the American, uh, other American historian Richard Bullion, um, where in his uh, short but very interesting book, *The Case for Islamo-Christian Civilization*. He says that the, the past of the West and so-called Islam, uh, or the two entities, cannot be understood without understanding the history of the other. So, reading, the past and future of the West cannot be fully comprehended without appreciation of the twin relationship it has had with Islam for over some 14 centuries. The same is true of the Islamic world. In, in another text, uh, Islam view from the edge, he speaks about the edge as, and the edge is, is not the margin, it's a place that is not the center. So it's not something uh, only minimal, no. But the edge, he says, that many things have happened in Islamic history where Muslim communities at the edge, in the sense of between brackets at the margin or in minority context, have contributed substantially to Islamic thought, to Islamic dynamics in general. And maybe Islam in Europe could be seen, could be read as an edge from which the Muslim community in general 
uh, is thinking, is proposing a particular reading of the tradition in a particular context, which is liberal, secular. Um, another historical note before I move on is uh, uh, by Maurice Berger. Having taught for a couple of years Islam in the West, uh, he compiled the book entitled A Brief History of Islam in Europe, where he studies the relationship between uh, Europe and uh, Muslims. Uh, well, at the end, he says that this interaction has been an interaction where fascination, respect, toleration, and conflict have been. So it's not, it has not been a bloodthirsty history, nor has it been a flourishing or beautiful history. There have been moments of conflict and moments of admiration and moments of uh, reciprocal respect, etc. European interaction with physical Islam, physical as well as virtual, imagined Islam, has been very diverse. Muslims have been enemies and allies, foreigners and compatriots, us and them. Their civilization has been feared as aggressive and expansionist, but also praised for its religious tolerance and its culture that has produced great and innovative artists, scientists and intellectuals to which Europe is indebted. Of course, when saying, starting with this historical note, I'm giving different historical points, uh, but some historians or scholars of the interaction between Islam and the West say, by this I'm not in any way uh, <coughs> proposing with this lecture or this research dialogue, but I'm saying that historians do focalize these elements of interaction to say that Islam and Muslims in Europe are not new. Uh, there have always been Islam and Muslims uh, in Europe. The Danish, uh, British, um, historian by background, but uh, sociologist also, uh, Jörg Nielsen speaks of four stages of the Muslim presence in Europe. The classical period of Muslim Spain and Muslim rule in Sicily. The Mongol period of the in 13th century, which has left Muslim communities like the Tatars in Russia, and then Muslims in Poland, Ukraine, in Caucasus, and Crimea. Then the Ottoman expansion and what has left over the Balkans of Islam Muslims in Balkans and Central Asia. And then, and then the current phase, uh, mostly post-World War II. Though, uh, again, there is no... Uh, uh, also, Muslims have been in Europe from First World War and they were part of the armies of the uh, colonial powers, the British, the French, for example. Um, and scholars have worked on that. But despite this interaction, this historical interaction, there is still fear of Islam and Muslims. Why? Hmm? Um, uh, Joseline Cesari, a um, scholar, a prominent scholar in the field of Islam in the West, outlines three major uh, reasons behind this fear of Islam in the West. First is the heritage of Orientalism, in which, uh, which is uh, mostly, but not only, uh, religious antagonisms between Christendom and Islamdom, and the recognition or not of the other. So in Orientalism, the Islam or Muslims uh, are the other, the religion is not recognized, um, and uh, or when uh, it is spoken about, it is uh, considered irrational religion, and it's made up religion by the Prophet Muhammad, um, etc. Uh, and this, these Orientalist views uh, have remained in the colonial period as well, and you know the work of Edward Said has uh, worked on that a lot. Um, and this, this imaginary of the Orient uh, is still there, according to Cesare. And then there is the securitization element or factor, especially after the rise of political Islam in the broad Middle East, not only the Arab Middle East, but the broad Middle East, meaning also uh, up to, uh, including Iran, with the Islamic Republic. And then the rise of the wear of the veil, uh, in French schools and then in the rest of uh, 
uh, European context. And then after 9-11 also and before the Wahhabization of Islam, in the sense that Wahhabism has become, in the media at least, uh, and some forms of journalism uh, as the major, as the representative for, some, for many of Islam and Muslims. And with this generalization that Wahhabism is a representation, the other versions of Islam and Ma of being Muslim are uh, become invisible. Uh, to the extent that some scholars speak of platonic, platonic Islamophobia. Platonic Islamophobia in the sense that some, in some contexts, in some societies, like a uh, uh, scholar in, from Poland, refers to uh, where there are only hundreds or a few thousand Muslims, but in the public media and in, uh, in the political discourse, there is fear of Islam and Muslims as if they were millions in the country. So there is kind of generalization and big aura about this issue to the extent that it became uh, the term Katarzyan, uh, that I have problem with pronouncing the name of the scholar, calls it platonic Islamophobia. Um, this, uh, this noted, and if I take an example of the French context, um, one can distinguish between uh, couple of scholarly uh, analyses uh, of Islam uh, uh, and how to solve issues that are related to Muslims in Europe. Some issues of, especially in the context of terrorism, international terrorism, local movements, etc. Um, I, I, I can distinguish between three trends, major trends. Uh, I think you are more familiar with the international scholars who have published or are uh, present in the public uh, by the use of English, maybe GQPL at Oliverois, but the last one maybe is not, uh, you know, you might not be familiar with. Uh, GQPL is said, uh, and this uh, distinction between the three and different levels of our different views of their analysis became apparent after the uh, terrorist events in France in 2015 onwards. Um, Jules Kippel is said to have a kind of culturalist or socialist approach that there is something with the religion and culture that has to be fixed, otherwise the problem of Muslims in Europe, especially in French context, have, um, will always face. Uh, Jules Kippel has different analysis, which is kind of um, socio, what we call it, socio-political, or uh, we can refer to it also as postmodernist because he doesn't see a problem with religion, but the way what the youth, especially the young people, do with religion. Uh, in his work, he says that while well, these young people claim to be Muslim, but they, they do convert to Islam only in the last uh, period of their life, um, so they don't live pious life, and at certain moments they do move to radical Islam, so they radicalize Islam. So there is a radicalization of religion here. And he, he says that this is a kind of search for nihilism, and, uh, it's a kind of nihilist attitude. It's search for uh, heroism and through radical, uh, through radicalism. And then uh, François Bourga has a different attitude. He criticizes the other two, and he says, actually, the problem with the, with the few radicals we have, but who make a lot of uh, noise and turmoil in society, is because of something that happens nearby in in, in the Middle East. He uh, mainly refers to the Palestinian uh, Israeli uh, conflict and he says as long as and then Western hegemony in the Middle East and uh, Western uh, kind of uh, uh, alliance with or work with uh, some dictators uh, uh, in the Arab world uh, so he says that as long as this uh, hegemonic view uh, or this uh, geostrategic issue is not solved, we'll always have problem at home in the sense of in Europe uh, through radicals. Um, so uh, this said then, we can say that there is a political science approach to the problem which is focalizes religion and uh, movements, Islamic movements or political Islam, radical one, and then the sociological and anthropological uh, approaches which have emerged from the 80s of the, the study of Islam in Europe from the 80s, from socio-anthropological approaches. Um, and then we, we don't have 
much literature yet on European Islamic theology, and that's why I'll be talking about that in a while, whether there is such a thing or not. Um, and Giuseppe Cesare Audrey says that um, there has remained uh, a leftover of Oriental studies in the study of religion in general, Islam in particular, um, uh, and uh, this has uh, reperca repercussions. And the German Oriental, uh, Oriental scholar of the Quran, Angelica Neuwirth, uh, speaks of political exigency in the, in the, in the study of Islam or uh, in Quran in particular. Uh, she says that uh, there is kind of uh, uh, the, the externalization of the study uh, of the Quran from biblical studies, methodologies, is done uh, kind of uh, for to serve certain <coughs> political exigency. This way to keep the tradition outside the so-called Judeo, uh, Judeo-Christian tradition to which Islam claims to belong. Um, this, these historical and methodological notes made, then uh, despite this, we still hear the concept of European Islam, right? And we'll do some chronology about the appearance of the word, and then we'll see what, what it means, at least according to some interpretations. Um, the, the, the idea of European Islam started to be used when the euro became an issue in the European uh, community with Maastricht Treaty, etc. So that's why the euro as a concept also entered into the theological religious sphere. Uh, and Bassan Tibi, German uh, of Syrian origin, the scholar of international relations, not of theology, coined the term in 1992 uh, in a conference in, in the Institut du Monde Arabe in uh, in Paris, uh, to speak of uh, secular, liberal Islam, rational Islam that is pluralist, that is uh, uh, that is has no place in the public sphere. Uh, so his, his view of European Islam is uh, à la française uh, in that sense. Then the concept started to appear clearly in titles of books, uh, of works, uh, uh, and, and one can refer to. Uh, Felici de Seto's uh, work, the, the construction of European Islam, socio-anthropological uh, socio approach. Then in 1999, three texts appeared with a title, when similar title more or less, Olivier Roy and Mir Nielsen that we referred to, uh, and then Tarek Ramadan, to be European Muslim. Afterwards, the title comes out in a couple of works, uh, in edited volumes, and the last one, more or less, is the Oxford Handbook of European Islam, and, and then also self promotion, my own work, the idea of European Islam. Um, there was avoidance of the concept uh, for mm, clear reason, uh, one would say, that uh, the Muslims themselves didn't use it uh, until recently, they do because Islam is seen as one, and there is no one British Islam, French Islam, Arab Islam, Asian Islam. Islam is one, and it manifests itself in different contexts, so no need to call it European Islam, but Islam in Europe, or Islam of Europe, for example. That's why, uh, that's the main justification for this. Um, uh, so, Islam in Europe uh, has become a field of study, uh, vast literature uh, so far, uh, from the 80s and 90s, uh, and especially especially after 9-11. Uh, a number of scholars have avoided the term European Islam, because that's not uh, uh, that's an in a question. Maybe theologians, Muslim background, can use that, but scholars um, of non-Muslim faith don't, or avoid it, uh, etc., or have intellectual reasons for that, because there is no literature that promotes it yet. That's why it's only Islam of Europe, or Islam in Europe, and not European Islam, so far. And that's, uh, we can discuss that later on. So uh, these are some examples, and I always refer to the Journal of Muslims in Europe, or the Yearbook of Muslims in Europe, which are now in their kind of uh, ninth, uh, ninth edition, 
a ninth year, uh, so they have accumulated uh, literature on, uh, uh, on the study of Islam in Europe. And the other examples are prominent examples uh, in the literature. Uh, then, in more simplistic form then, one could say, well, uh, maybe there is European Islam, or let's say European Islam or Islam in Europe. You can, uh, and we can decide about that maybe later on. Um, uh, there are those who reject the concept and the possibility that there could be European Islam. And these are either the populists, the Islamophobes, or ex-Muslims who speak against that. So, to be European, to be British, to be French, it means you have to leave it out to give out religion, uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's it. So you have to be ex-Muslim to be European. Uh, and then there are the skeptics, and they will refer to, 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 to the scholar attitude I, I, I mean here. And then the confidence, who, who do think that there is European Islam. Sociologically, anthropologically, there are proofs that there is European Islam. There are Muslims who do feel European and of Muslim faith. There are four generations, they, have been, uh, they, they are born here, or some of them have their grandparents born here in, in Europe, so they, they are and they feel European. And their Islamicity and their religiosity is in that sense European. I do distinguish between two views, probably, um, about those who, who study European Islam. Leaving aside the skeptics, uh, not the skeptics, leaving aside the rejectionists, um, who don't want any Muslim or Islam in the country. I'm speaking with a scholarly attitude with the study of Islam, yeah. Islamic intellectual Islam, for example, in Europe. Um, Olivier Roy and Jörn Nielsen. The difference between the two, I don't know if you are familiar with their work, or how far you are familiar with their work, but um, maybe some quotes uh, could do help. Um, starting with Olivier Roy. He says, we see then at the beginning minority fact that the minority fact that does not necessarily bring about theological or jurisprudential aggiornamento, but rather a disconnection between the theological debate and the creativity of a religiosity which is centered on the individual. It, I mean individualized European Islam, is not a reformed Islam because not only the dogma but also the corpus of interpreters and jurists remain uncontested. European Islam is deterritorialized, de uh, deprived of institutions that could impose norms, who are currently wrong to wait for theological reform, or theological voice for the liberalization of practices like the veil, food, etc., which would allow to the Muslims to adapt to Occidental norms. What is changing is not religion, but religiosity. So, uh, Olivia Wa, in the sense, he says that we cannot speak about European Islam and if there is an aggiornamento, uh, an update, a reformation, an institutional reformation of religion, and there is no institution that does or can take that role of reform. So, he says that what, is, what we see is individualization of modern values. European Muslims in Europe do individualize liberty, equality, and other uh, values, core values, sub-values, political values, um, without this touching the core classical Islamic theological uh, values, which is an attitude, which is, uh, which is true. But at the same time, from an intellectual perspective, there is kind of some debate within Muslim community, uh, which, that, which doesn't make of it mainstream debate. But this is what, where your Nielsen comes in and says, no, there is an internal debate, and it's mostly theological debate among Muslims, and it could lead somewhere. Um, and he says, less attention is being, less is being, attention is being paid to the internal debates taking place. Here, there is a range of philosophical and theological discussions, which in many ways remind one of the debates which changed among Islamic theologians in the formative periods of the 8th, 11th centuries. Uh, as where he says, European Muslims are asking fundamental questions about Islam. Fiqh, which focuses on legal matters, is being questioned. And theology, which focuses on morality, is being given more weight. And this is the key element why I say 
uh, your lesson here is uh, closer to the intellectual debate of some Muslims in Europe, some intellectual Muslims in Europe. Uh, because there is negotiation of the, the place of fiqh or legal matters in Islam, and there is focalization or focus on, on morality and ethics. And this is a note that he underlines. Um, I can, and your lesson is not alone. I referred earlier to Valice Daseto and other uh, socio-anthropologists who have done work, field work on this, saying that Muslims are adapting to Europe. Again, uh, it's true, as Roy says, that uh, maybe there is no theological clear institutions that take these advances and legitimize them theologically. But uh, uh, on the other hand, Nielsen says, no, there is. And we'll see some examples, some few self-made or uh, theologians, Imam theologians, who, who adopt a lot of these individualized values in the words of Freud and try to legitimize them from within the tradition. So, uh, José Cesaris, Tiparadier, Bétis Seigneur, Brigitte Marichal, John Bowen, Jonathan Lawrence, Oliver Shah Brothers, these are uh, some of the scholars that have uh, produced on, on the issue a lot of work on, uh, on, on, on Muslims uh, in, in Europe and their integration in institutions and etc. Um, so, uh, again, um, if there is such a thing, of if there isn't, but who can tell us if there is there a European Islam or if there is not? Shall we listen to scholars? Uh, since made or have uh, graduated and do work in, in so-called secular modern universities or intellectuals who navigate between scientific work and the public uh, uh, work uh, or politicians who also work as public intellectuals uh, or theologians, imams or female leaders, female uh, um, religious guides, or Moshidat, or so-called self-made, uh, self-proclaimed uh, uh, women imams, uh, as we will see some cases later on. So who does represent uh, European Islam? Who can talk about it? Who can tell us whether it is and what what does um, uh, what is it composed of? What is its theological attitude on on this and this? How is it different from Islam in the Arab world, Islam in Saudi Arabia, Islam in Morocco, Islam in Algeria or Turkey? How is it different from the Islam that is promoted by representative bodies of sending countries, classically sending countries, Turkey, Morocco, Algeria, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, etc. Because they have their representative bodies that try to link their uh, Muslim uh, kind of uh, diaspora with the, their countries of origin for various reasons, political and also economic, for their literacy, etc. So who can, uh, should, should we listen to? That's why the, the issue of European Islam is not easy, it's complicated, because the stakeholders are, are, are many. Or should we listen to Islamic councils and institutions? The European Center for Fatwa and Research, established in 1997 in Dublin, or uh, various confederations, federations, state councils created after 9-11? Or should we take into account or listen to the Islamic movements that have roots or background in, in Islamic majority countries, but they are up present in Europe and the rest of the world, like the Wahhabi tendencies, of Wahhabi tendencies, of Muslim Brotherhood tendencies, of Nahda and Tunisian, movement tendency of Korean movement, Turkish Korean movement, or uh, or Tablir Jamaat, or the Ubandis. So all these are all contribute to making the debate um, difficult to, to 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 discuss, but at the same time uh, uh, engage it. Or should we listen to the ones who make much noise, the jihadis, the Al Qaeda, ISIS, uh, Hezbollah Tahrir, for example? And which country should we take as maybe a model in Europe that has advanced or not in the issue of Islam and Muslims in Europe? Is it French, the British, the German, Belgian, the Italian, or none of them? Because each one has its own legal, institutional tradition, its own dealing, its own way of dealing with religion in general and 
uh, has its own Islamic institutions that are recognized, semi-recognized, being slowly, gradually recognized. So all these are issues to take into account when defining what Islam in Europe means, what European Islam means. That's why, for sure, one cannot come up with uh, one definitive answer. Still, still, a definition has. Scholars work with definitions which do include and do, do exclude. So this European Islam that we might uh, be focusing on here is, or European Islamic thought, we can call it so interchangeably, uh, mean this, Islam, this European Islam means any discourse or concept or idea that claims to be minimally or maximally Islamic and European in theory and or practice, irrespective of the degree of this affiliation to Islam and Muslim. In the sense that it, this definition tries to be inclusive, so as not to limit it to so-called conservative or so-called liberal or so-called moderate, etc. Whoever claims to have this affiliation to Europe and to Islam could be considered uh, uh, an advocate or uh, a defender of the idea of, of European Islam or practitioner of European Islam, whether he defines it so or not. Um, this European Islam, as we see, because literature is still little, theologically, and to study it, we can think of three levels of approaching it cosmological, the cosmic view, or the world view, and then society access, uh, that's the first access, world access, then society access, and individual access. So it's only through clear axes or points that we can un understand what particular religion, world religion claims or advances. And European Islam, in this case, could be understood also through these levels. So what does European Islam tell us on the world, on that level of access? How does it interpret the world? Is it different from the classical view Muslims have? Or no, it's the same. And the focus is on the second level or access, which is society. So it's more social affairs that are focalized, are studied, while the cosmological, moral cosmology of the Quran and Islam is the same, but society Social affairs are negotiated, re-examined, re or the individual that is focalized, because in liberal context the individual is hmm, sacred, the autonomy is the value to champion first and liberty. So the individual maybe in European Islam is the major element that is focalized, or maybe all of them. Hmm? So here scholars differ. Even the so-called secular or liberal scholars, some of them do manage to to have uh, to touch all these levels but most of them do uh, touch the social and individual level hmm? of course I, I use uh, different concepts which we cannot introduce here different uh, different concepts uh, for analysis uh, uh, to facilitate this understanding at the theoretical level when we are dealing with a particular issue um, but again, uh, for example, at the world level, to, to, to simplify, uh, we can use that there is kind of humanization of revelation. I, I have these, yeah? at the world axis, there is kind of, uh, European Islam humanizes the world through divinely weak inheritance for cosmic well-being, based on the principle of fraternity. So, there is here kind of taking the world and its diversity as sacred, everything in this world is sacred. So everything is justified by revelation itself and it should not be negated. So it's kind of an inclusive approach to diversity that classically maybe was not because the other was either infidel, is non-Muslim, but some scholars now are trying to reclaim the universality of religion by opening up, by uh, uh, focalizing uh, certain values that at certain historical moments were not focalized, but they were there. So the potential is there, but now they do uh, focalize them. For what? For cosmic well-being. And that 
Cosmic well-being is not, not only human well-being, but that touches also nature, environment. So it's also an ethicist message uh, towards the universe as well. And all human beings have to work fraternally for that good cosmic well-being. And then on the, at the social level, uh, European Islam historicizes revelation through practical work. Practical work in the sense that it's pragmatic, it's uh, adaptive. Uh, fiqh has, has always been pragmatic because it, there, there is no book of Sharia. There are different books, so, uh, which means that Sharia has been flexible in that sense. And here there is kind of um, emphasizing that flexibility, reclaiming flexibility that the nation state in the Islamic world has tried to make rigid into making Islamic law a rigid positive law while it was uh, it was not so before the nation state, and that's another debate. Why there is this attempt of historicizing revelation for social well-being? Because religion is for good people to facilitate human life in society and for the individual later on. That's why there is an emphasis on, for example, the value of equality, equality of all everyone, Muslim and non-Muslim, male and female. Uh, while classically there were some distinguishes, distinctions. Uh, for political matters, for tax, um, tax payments, and etc. But these are classical, and now these some scholars, uh, critical scholars, reformist scholars, do uh, historicize these classical uh, concepts. And then at the individual level, at the individual level or axis, there is a kind of rationalization of, uh, of faith. Uh, European Islam rationalizes individual faith through the principle of ethical liberty for individual well-being based on the principle of liberty. So here again, there is uh, uh, liberty in faith. To, to, be, to have faith or to leave faith is focalized by uh, uh, scholars here um, and they consider it uh, something that is promoted by the Quran itself. Uh, and with that, uh, it means that there is no guardianship on the individual uh, on the condition that the individual is, is rational, is able uh, to, 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 to responsibly be, be, be free. Um, I would, uh, of course, skip this slide. Uh, so in that sense, European Islam aims at rationalizing ethics. And this is another debate, I, um, but I'm putting it in simplistically that way. Also, this European Islam is, is, not funda is not radically reformist. It's revisionist, because there is no radical uh, breakup with the divine, with the idea of the metaphysical and the divine and revelation. There is kind of reform, call for reform, but it is mild, I call it. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that other tendencies, other schools, other movements in Islamic tradition, Islamic history have done, either in the uh, classical period, uh, uh, and reference is often made to the Mu'tazila, but not only. Anyway, a reference is made to the dynamic period in Islamic history and Islamic thought. Or a reference is made to the 19th century and early 20th century uh, Renaissance movements, or Arab Islamic so-called Nahta or to recently to the generation of post-1967 intellectual tradition, intellectual movement, and if we refer to the Arab world in particular. So these are uh, moments, historical moments, that can, uh, through which we can study the development of uh, history of ideas in, uh, and these concepts. That's why I also refer to the Muslim person in European context as Muslim Prometheus. Prometheus, you know, he doesn't need to call, Muslim Prometheus doesn't need to call, uh, to kill God to, you know, to get the torch of knowledge, and by knowledge here I, I mean sovereignty, he's meant sovereignty. Uh, there is no tragedy here. So God is not killed. That's why I said before, there is, uh, the idea of revelation remains as a source of ethics, of guidance. Because uh, if, uh, if ethics as fully or rational, then there is no need for the Quran and no need for revelation as a source of guidance in the first place. But these scholars know they do keep the sacredness uh, of the Quran and they they generally speak uh, of uh, 
the sources of uh, ethics um, uh, they're not being purely <coughs> purely rational. That's why there is uh, some scholars have different views about what to call these scholars. Are they reformists? Are they liberal? Are they secular? So some scholar, call them critical scholars, and that's it. Uh, some call them progressive scholars. Some say they are reformists. Some say, no, we are not reformists. We are not reforming anything. We are just being critical. Because reform means that there is one central authority in the uh, pope-like uh, hierarchy, or, and then uh, this council or the would uh, make a reformation and uh, make it valid for everyone. But there is no such thing in Islamic uh, tradition, and in the Sunni tradition, at least in Shia, we can think of one, and the leadership of spiritual leader. Um, so in that absence, so this is not reform, this is adaptation. But some say, no, this adaptation is reformist. And we move on. How are we with time? You can always uh, let me know. Uh, I think I have some 10 minutes, 15 minutes max. Uh, so in other words, there is adaptation here to modernity, but to legal modernity. But not to the world view of modernity as reason, no, as the answer. Reason has the answer for human beings. No, reason has the answer for legal matters, for social matters. Uh, that's why this European Islam is liberal, yes. Uh, is secular, yes. Because it, it, um, uh, it works within already consolidated liberal secular democracies. So this European Islam does not seek power as political Islam maybe in the Arab world or in the Islamic uh, world. Here, Islam in Europe, in this, this version I'm talking about, this version of Islam in Europe uh, uh, leaves power aside and focalizes on ethics and morality. And that's why I, we can say that there is, its modernity is legal modernity. As its cosmic worldview, it remains uh, traditional and re faithful to the Islamic classical uh, tradition that there is, uh, uh, that human reason can help, but is not every, is not everything. It does not have all answers to human questions in simplistic terms. I put this work, we can put it in, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the framework of a project of philosopher, a uh, Moroccan philosopher called Tahad Rahman. He calls this uh, paradigm, he calls it trusteeship paradigm. Trust in Arabic is a manna. Um, and human beings are on earth as a trust. And their work and their life is a trust. And so what they do and what they should do should be ethicist in the first place. Um, so that's why he calls, in simplistically, he calls this project of Islamic modernity trusteeship paradigm. And I think that European Islam works within this paradigm of trusteeship because it does not distance itself from classical Islamic worldview Quranic moral, uh, moral uh, cosmology, but only in social matters it has given place to reason to adapt to the European context. That's why it is Islamic and European. Um, I think that's uh, all what I should say from a theoretical perspective, and uh, I intended to give examples from for uh, uh, for of two scholars. One is a theologian imam, self-made theologian, and one is philosopher by training in French context. I refer to them by name and maybe two few words, and then I, I close. Uh, that's Tariq Oprou. Uh, he came to France for to study uh, um, uh, uh, medicine, and, uh, but he with time he found a kind of vocation for religion and he started as kind of a, a Muslim brother but then gradually moved on and now he's considered uh, one of the, if not the, the French uh, Islam uh, model because he navigates between tradition and modernity. Uh, he, he uses um, fatwa, for example, apparatus or mechanism to speak of, to facilitate life, legal issues, especially related to creed, 
uh, and social affairs and work of Muslims, young Muslims, uh, who have problems in modern contexts and institutions, and at the same time mm, uh, want to keep the faith. So he, he works on that uh, level. He speaks of uh, uh, he speaks of geotheology, geo speaks of Sharia with a minority, and speaks of European Islam. And uh, he says that um, there is a need to relativize everything in religion so as to make it uh, adaptive, uh, contextualizable. Um, uh, and then he uses the term of Sharia of the minority, which is uh, kind of close to the meaning of Fiqh uh, al aqaliyat uh, but at the same time he says it's different, this is uh, Eurocentric in the sense that it focalizes the European context while Fiqh al aqaliyat uh, which is classical uh, school of uh, studying the needs uh, of minorities of Muslims in non-Muslim context uh, and it has the foundation that is the European Council for Photo and Research in Dublin uh, that, 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 that has this um, uh, perspective, but he distinguishes itself and his methodology from their work. And then he speaks about localization, that at the end, religion is practiced at the local level, and imam theologians should have knowledge enough to give right answers to their local uh, believers according to their needs on the basis of case by case and not generic views that can answer, uh, you know, fatwas that pass back to, you know, uh, fatwas that are applicable to everyone, everywhere. No, uh, he speaks about positive fatwa and negative fatwa. Um, negative fatwa in the sense that he abstains from giving view because there is already an implicit answer either in law or by another fatwa somewhere else. Or positive fatwa is where he intervenes to fill in a gap. If uh, someone goes to him and asks him, can I do this and this because I know I have this and this problem, we can do case studies later on to simplify this. Um, so anyway, he, he tries to work from within the legal tradition of, uh, of Islam to give adequate answers. He has huge followers in the Bordeaux Mosque, he's the direct director of the mosque, and some anthropological work and anthropologists who followed him says that um, uh, the followers on Fridays, Prayers, for example, can reach some 3,000 people or so. Um, and then there is, uh, this is a conservative but at the same time contextualist approach of Tarek Ubru. On the other level, we have an intellectual who studied philosophy, uh, who is of, uh, he, he, he is not converted, his mother converted, but so he was born Muslim. He did uh, L'Ecole Normale Supérieure, which is the elitist French uh, uh, higher education school, you know, and he went through a spiritual crisis and he started negotiating, questioning everything, etc. At the end, he went back to tradition and came up with his uh, self Islam approach. He says that it's not individualist, it's personal. It's personalist or personal in the sense that uh, there is moral responsibility in being Muslim. You can be super autonomous in your religiosity. But at the same time, um, uh, there is a responsibility in what uh, you believe. While there is chronological development in his, uh, uh, in his uh, uh, approach of Islam in Europe, or Islam in France in particular, starting with self-Islam and then starting with magnum opus, his most interesting work is Islamic existentialism. Uh, and then uh, his late stage is to overcome both religion and atheism because he is not satisfied with religion in the classical sense, orthodox sense, nor with um, atheism as an answer for human beings in modern times. Because for him, reason again doesn't give answers to a human internal spiritual quest. Um, I have one quote from him. I'll read it to you aloud. Uh, it makes uh, it may maybe help you remember exactly what he means. His approach is influenced by Ibn Arabi and, and Iqbal, Pakistani Muhammad, uh, uh, Hindu Pakistani uh, Muhammad Iqbal. Uh, he says, There is no longer a separation between the sacred and the profane. Neither is there any longer what is sacred and what is profane. The great life of Allah is at the same time all that is sacred all that is profane, all our beliefs, and all our 
atheism. For my part, I do not consider that praying is an act more sacred than speaking, nor that the mosque is a sacred place while the street is profane. I live in a world where the sacred has trespassed its own limits, like a stream that drifts over everything. Making love is sacred, laughing is sacred, sharing is sacred, like meditating or fasting. And I have realized in these conditions that I can lead my any particular way of life without stopping a second from feeling being Muslim. Whether I pray or not, whether I eat pork or not, has strictly no importance. My Islam has nothing more of the religious. It is not, a, it is not an Islam of rituals, but of vision, of contemplation of Allah and the diversity of the world. And quote, Bidar is an Islam. So this is one, another version of European Islam. Uh, he started conservative in the traditional orthodox sense and then moved to being what you, you, you can uh, understand from his quote. Uh, so maybe his interpretation of Wahdat al-Wujud and whatever human beings do is sacred is manifest in his interpretation of being uh, Muslim. Uh, uh, and uh, in that sense, he, there is, uh, I can also between markets refer to the perennial, perennialist school among some Muslim uh, scholars in, in Europe. I refer to the British uh, uh, convert, for example, Guy Eaton, uh, and his, uh, his view of Islam and, uh, in modern times. Uh, he's uh, very uh, a critical of consumerist societies and Jew modernity in that sense. Uh, and he puts himself in the perennial uh, school, uh, perennial school in that uh, uh, classical uh, divine religions, revealed religions, uh, 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 at the end lead to the same, uh, the same path. That's uh, in Arabic, al Farsa al Khalida. And we can uh, refer to that or discuss that afterwards. Uh, that's in general what I wanted to say about European Islam, intellectual European Islam. And, and the other part of the paper, uh, of the presentation, is supposed to be about religious authority and imams. You know, I will say only a few things about imams. Uh, uh, you know, imams in the Islamic, uh, those of you who do Islamic studies, know that it's not a religious authority in classical sense. He's not a person of high erudition. Uh, he, he could be a person of high erudition, but he's a person who does local work in guiding Muslims to pray in, in a mosque. Of course, some classical uh, major scholars are called Imam Ahmad, Imam Malik, Imam, but these are uh, giant uh, kind of pioneers of particular paths of interpreting uh, Islamic uh, fiqh, religious uh, law. Um, uh, but imams in the in the in the in, in the quotidian way is the person who guides, and anyone can be an imam. Anyone who knows a minimum of uh, of Islam or rituals can lead Muslim community. And especially after 9/11 and the terrorist events in Europe, imams have become kind of the ones who should solve problems of Muslim community and terrorism, which is a responsibility that they didn't have in Islamic history, nor can they have now. In uh, at least so far in, in modern context because um, they are only uh, a cog in a chain they are only uh, a piece in, uh, in, in a chain of authorities and in a chain of stakeholders who influence the debate of Islam and Muslims in Europe so um, uh, I don't want to say that much uh, on this but uh, I close with that note uh, Edmund Aslan uh, in Vienna University who has worked on the topic, he says that uh, we should not uh, expect super imam who solves problems in Europe or elsewhere uh, because for this reason he is a local player, uh, manager of a house of worship or mosque and, uh, and often so far they are imams are of lower education, well, uh, very badly paid or not paid, are paid uh, voluntarily, so how can you expect them to solve big problems in society when their social status is very low, lower education, or they do it uh, by volunteering? Uh, so these are issues that uh, religious authority faces, 
and there is no, again, at a time when there is no central religious authority, when there is no uh, established so far uh, centers of religious training of Muslim background, of Islamic faith, of Islamic theology in Europe, then it's, uh, uh, it will remain uh, a problem. That's why countries from the outside Europe, sending countries, uh, do send imams to accompany their diaspora in Europe, to fill in a gap that is uh, uh, not filled. Uh, and uh, Turkey, Algeria, and Morocco, and in the Moroccan case better, are examples of countries that send imams. There are now some cases of seminaries or colleges uh, that try, try to train these imams of lower education and religious, or sometimes they also speak badly the language, the local language, uh, of the country where they are. So how can they communicate with a new generation of Muslims who speak German, Dutch, uh, English, French, while they speak, these Imams speak only Arabic or only Turkish, for example. So there is, there is uh, a lot of work that is uh, being uh, kind of underlined for work for these institutions. But still, there are some case studies in some countries where there are colleges or seminaries that have come uh, done so far after I refer to the Cambridge Muslim College in the UK, which is um, a small college in, the, uh, in Cambridge, but has been doing very interesting work for the last uh, kind of nearly a decade uh, in training imams and religious leaders and women and men, and they give them teachings in philosophy, in languages, in, in psychology, in conflict resolution, in, in, in dialogue, in peace building, in uh, in literature, in, uh, so that they, they become really uh, well equipped culturally uh, and socially and also well integrated uh, financially, etc. afterwards. Um, with that, I, I close and I leave the floor to you. Thank you.